Hello and welcome to our latest episode of Security Noise, What I Did at Hacker Summer Camp. Today we have Aaron James and Luke Bremer with us today, who are application security consultants at TrustedSec, and they're going to share with us their experiences at Black Hat and DEF CON this year. Of course, we also have our producer, Skylar Tudor, to help make the show sound great. I do want to mention our Discord server again. It is discord.gg slash trustedsec if you want to join. I do have one quick, in case you missed it, type announcement as well. We've got a new, rather severe Microsoft uh, security vulnerability with TCP IP version 6. That is CVE 2024-38063. It is warmable, and it will uh, give you some kernel mode arbitrary code execution if you can exploit that one. A little bit of a wind nuke kind of vibes going on here. So if you haven't done so, make sure you've got those systems patched. Well, guys, welcome to the show. Uh, if you want to take a minute to introduce yourselves, I will uh, hand you to the floor. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm Aaron James. As Jeff mentioned, senior security consultant on the application security team. I've been pen testing for, I don't know, maybe seven years, I think, at this point. Um, last five of which at, uh, with TrustSec on the app team. Yeah, um, my name is Luke Bremer. I'm a senior security consultant at TrustSec as well. Um, as a developer for about a decade before this, and then I've been interested in security for about six or so years now and been at TrustedSec for three and a half, four. Okay. Well, with that, we will launch right into our show. Uh, perhaps Skyler wants to say hello quickly first. Oh, hey, how's it going, everybody? <laughs> Hi, Skyler. Glad to have you as always. Always glad to be here. So who all went to uh, DEF CON and Black Hat this year? I know I didn't get a chance. Not me. Uh, from the app team, it was just Luke and I, I think. Yeah. A couple of the people from um, the Force team that does network fan testing are the red team had a huge presence because they're doing trainings at Black Hat and a bunch of other folks, you know, uh, on the administrative side of, of TrustSec or, or the leadership level. Yeah, a combination of a little bit of the sales, a little bit of force, a little bit of AppSec. I think we had maybe two or three from each team, um, which is always nice to see kind of the upper management sales being a work remote company. Mostly, you don't get to see all those people all the time. So get to see the people that uh, you talk to every day in, in person. Yeah, so that's definitely a reason to go the camaraderie. And of course, uh, it's also an opportunity to maybe interface with some folks at other organizations and in other roles and in clients that you've met in the past and get to see once a year at, at cons and things like that. I know it's one aspect of it I always look forward to. I believe, Luke, this was your first time. And Aaron, I'm not sure if it was yours. It was um, definitely my first time to both Vegas and to Black Hat and DEF CON. Um, Luke, I'll let him speak for himself, but um, he's been to Vegas at least a couple of times. But this was entirely a, a brand new experience for me. A um, couple of different pitfalls that I, I navigated, uh, but really enjoyed the overall experience. Yeah, I've never been to DEF CON and, or Black Hat, but uh, the cultural uh, takeaways were pretty significant. There's a lot of cool stuff going on. You know, more stuff than you can take in in the period of time that you have, which was really did, cool. Did you have like a, a buddy or a, like a guide to, to get you through? Vegas. <laughs> well, no, the reason I bring that up is because that was one of the things, one of my takeaways was, or any recommendation for someone that was going to go for their first time would be to link up with someone who has been there before, because there's even, there's simple things like Luke mentioned, like, oh, meet me at the monorail. And I have no idea what the monorail is. I have no idea why that would be useful. But it turns out it was, and it was like, wow, it's pretty actually important to know. So that kind of thing is, that was really useful. Um, so what was your question? Link up with a buddy? Yeah, Luke was the one. Um, and then Lou from our, Lou Shikitano from our force team. He's been to DEF CON. I don't remember how many times, but he uh, was a wealth of information. So I kind of approached the entire thing as like, there was one technical talk and we can, I'm sure we can get into these details, but there was one technical talk I really wanted to listen to. And the rest of it was just kind of no expectations going in and dipping my toes in the water um, which in and of itself was kind of something that I learned, you know, I would do things differently next time. But for a first time there, it was, um, it was nice going in, just open-minded and kind of going with the flow. Yeah. So I mean, with it being off, off the strip this time, I mean, uh, did, did you get some time like on the strip and get to see a lot of the attractions? Maybe. I think so. If I know Maybe. what the strip is. <laughs> Fair. Luke, I'll defer to you. You were his guide. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. So we actually got a little bit lucky because we got there a few days before Black Hat and Dave offered to go take around everybody. So we had a group of six or seven people, people, veterans, non-veterans. Um, so we had people like um, me and Aaron who are not necessarily new to the industry, but new to Black Hat and DEF CON. And then you had people that were in, have been in the industry, have been to um, Black Hat DEF CON, you know, 10 plus times and been in the industry for 20 plus years. So we, we got lucky and Dave got to take us around and show us some kind of this is where things used to be. This is where we used to stay. This is how, you know, we used to interact and this is how it's changed over the years. So um, yeah, we got to, as much as Aaron says I was his guide, I would say that we kind of traveled in three groups of three or four a lot of the time. And then we would link up when we got to uh, the conferences and stuff. Um, but yeah, we got to go, like like Aaron said, I've been to Vegas a few times before for other conferences, um, for vacation and stuff like that. So I'm familiar with um, kind of the layout of everything and what there is to see um, outside of the conferences and stuff. It's one of those interesting places where there's really good food, really good shows, and the atmosphere is just very different from anything else you would you would go to. So having uh, technical conferences in a place where there's a wealth of things to do, you're not just going to sit at the hotel room. You're going to go find something to go do with somebody. So, but yeah, this being my first DEF CON, I've, I've been to um, plenty of local conventions and stuff. Um, and uh, so my only comparison is kind of from my local to the kind of big stage, right? Um, and then even the differences from Black Hat and DEF CON were, were interesting. DEF CON is very community driven and Black Hat is very, you know, sales driven. Everybody wants to scan your badge before you even get a donut, right? But at uh, DEF CON, yeah. nobody, nobody cares. Um, and if you want to go sit down at a table, then go sit down at a table. So yep. it's interesting. Well, it's, yeah, I, I mean, I would almost say having been to DEF CON a few times that you know, you, you probably shouldn't expect too much the first time you go. Uh, um, you almost need some experience with it to know how it all works to to really get the the maximum benefit. And even if you've been there a number of times, I think you definitely want to want to go with some buddies, some coworkers, you know, some folks you know, especially some folks that share some similar interests. I think it's worth kind of planning out ahead of time, you know, what talks you maybe want to make sure you hit, you know, what villages and stuff you want to make sure you visit, uh, and then just kind of following your nose from there. That, you know, that that to me is the way to enjoy it. Uh, would you guys all agree with that now that uh, you've got at least one under your belts? Yeah, actually, everything you just said is exactly the conclusions I arrived at as I was like writing up my notes and things, because there are so many things that you're like, that would be awesome. Uh, but I didn't really know how to engage with that stuff going in. And now, yeah, exactly what we said. I think next time if I go again, it will be, I will have, a, um, because time is so precious and there's so many things to look at or like things that you want, you know, talks you want to be in line for or villages that you want to make sure you're, you're at, the, at the right time. Um, yeah, planning ahead is what I would do next time and have specific goals in mind. Yeah, I, I think in, in the before four times, DEF CON was split up between, you know, it, three to five hotels. And so you you really had to plan accordingly to get to whatever tracks you wanted to get to and any talks or trainings that you you wanted to see. How did that, how do you think that compared to the new venue with it being at, you know, one centralized location? How, how difficult was it to plan? So for like our local cons that we have in where I live, it's all in one building. And so it was very similar to that type of atmosphere. That's what I was used to. You, you know, you have track one, two, three, four, and they're in, you know, conference room one, two, three, four. And so then you go to those tracks and it's in one area. There's an area for the vendors. There's an area for the villages and it's all in one big building. Obviously this is scaled up times 50. So, you know, the villages are three times the size and the talk halls are four times as big. So for me, it was very much what I'm used to. And I think I would I probably would not have preferred being on the strip and having to be like, oh, I want to go see, you know, maybe there's an AppSec talk that I wanted to go see um, at 11 and there was another one I wanted to go see at 1. Well, as soon as I'm done with that talk at maybe noon, I don't want to have to walk halfway down the strip to go to some other talk and, and miss out on, you know, standing in line with somebody or working on a village or something like that. So for me, it, is, it fit very well with what I'm used to a conference being. Did you guys do LineCon? No, okay. very small amount. Um, I was actually surprised when we got our badges. It was massive line. There must have been I don't know five hundred people in line, and it took thirty minutes. So I was like, "They're they're they're moving it. They know what's going on." 
Nice. Put somebody waited in line for five hours for merch. Uh, oh, wow. Thursday. This year? But, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I don't think that was the case all day, but I think they may have just hit the worst possible conditions. But yeah, so there, it exists. And I saw a lot of comments online about people were trying to get into certain talks. Uh, and then by the time it showed up, the lines were already too long. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. I mean, we should talk about some don'ts uh, as far as attending the conference. And I, I think, you know, I, I would say merch is a big one. If you're not after that DEF CON t-shirt that you can only get there, mm-hmm. all those other hacker products and stuff, you can get those things online. I mean, it, it's kind of fun to see them at the tables, but I think it's not a good use of time to stand in, in, in line three hours to get into the merch room if, if that's what it takes. And it does take that sometimes, yep. which... Yeah, it's not a personal interest in mine. Last year, it took me three hours and 28 minutes uh, because a buddy of mine who was with me timed it. He started a timer on his phone <laughs> and we waited. Um, it, but it was cool, though, is uh, they did the the mobile order so you can actually see the whole merch line on your phone. Mm-hmm. And then you just tap what you want. It creates a QR code for your order. And so when you get up to checkout, you just show them the code and then they go get your stuff. Unfortunately, by the time you got up to the front, like half the things you <laughs> selected to get uh, were, were already sold out. So if you do decide to do the merch line con, um, get there early, bring some snacks. So uh, maybe it was a happy accident for us, but we, we hearing the stories of, like Aaron said, someone, one of the trusted sick folks standing in line five hours, six hours plus. Um, we didn't go on, on day one. We ended up going um, uh, late Friday um, and uh, the merch line was very short, but like you said, they're out of almost everything. Um, but it being the first DEF CON, I wanted to get something to just to say, hey, this, you know, whatever t-shirt, hat, whatever. So we just got a sticker pack. Um, and so we'd stick at the back of your computer or whatever that line took 15 minutes. So nice. I waited in merch for 15 minutes. I didn't get a shirt. I didn't really want a shirt. Um, and I got enough of them, my black hat, um, from all the vendors. So, um, Speaking of which, you still have that shirt we got for Jeff. I do. We got to send it to Jeff. We, it, yeah, we didn't tell you, Jeff, we got you a, a check mark shirt and you're, you're just going to love it. It just screams, <laughs> it screams Jeff. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> Well, so which which con is more valuable, Black Hat or or, or DEF CON? Mm, probably, I mean, entirely subjective. Um, you know, it's going to depend on who you are. But I thought about that question um, because I think if you're going to something like the the training that our red team gave, I think that's worth the money because there's nowhere else you're going to get that level of quality training. But a lot of the Black Hat is then pretty corporate, and it's really geared towards people that are trying to secure enterprise uh, infrastructure, it seems. Whereas DEF CON is quite the opposite and a lot of grassroots, open source things, um, much more community driven as Luke mentioned. Um, So is it worth it? Uh, Which one's better? I think it depends on who you are and what you're looking to get out of it. Um, But there's definitely reasons to go to both. And I don't think either of them is overblown if if the reasons are right. Well, I mean, for a lot of people, they're gonna have to probably choose one or the other because if you are, being sent by your employer or something like that. You know, most folks are probably not lucky enough to be given a whole week to <laughs> go play in Vegas. So, you know, which one do I ask my boss to send me to and why? Yeah. And and I'll kind of piggyback on what Aaron said too, is it definitely depends what you're looking to get out of it. I would say that my local cons, I normally go to a lot of talks. So if there's maybe 10, um, 10 talks in a day, I'll go to like six or seven and spend, you know, only maybe two hours in the vendor area and outside of that, um, because I want to know, you know, what's going on locally and what people are doing locally. And and I would say that that's kind of true. That that's also true in the black hat side of it. There's very technical talks that'll get you what you need. I would say that's not as much on the DEFCON stuff. There are good talks there, but you there's way more value in the villages that are there and the people that are there and the community that's there. So if you're someone who is not necessarily into the culture. There are people that they just do security for work. I just do this as a job. I don't do it outside of work. I think Black Hat's for you. If you are a hobbyist, I think DEF CON is for you. I kind of, yeah, I agree with Luke on that. Uh, and I kind of went into it that with that mindset. I want to come up with something technical, something actionable, something I can go put into practice immediately. But then as I'm going through all this DEF CON material, like, I find myself being interested in a lot of things that aren't in my wheelhouse whatsoever. But I think there's a lot of value there because it it drives you to 
pursue things that you're curious about. Uh, and that can oftentimes, I think, produce benefits down the road um, that you don't expect necessarily. So I went in with the idea of like, I want to come up with something that I can add to my methodology on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and then actually ended up pursuing a lot of weird things like the badge um, SAO stuff, uh, which isn't, you know, hardware stuff is not typically my wheelhouse, but um, found myself because of DEF CON being more and more um, interested in it. So we'll see where that goes. That, that to me is an interesting piece of DEF CON is, is you do get exposed to a lot of stuff that you maybe didn't know you were interested about. You can just kind of stroll past the villages and go, Ooh, that's interesting. I, you know, hadn't looked at a SCADA controller before. I, I didn't even know those were something I would be interested in. And, you know, you can actually put your hands on it and touch it. Um, one of the things I've always enjoyed is the Tampa Evident Village a lot. Um, that, that's one of my favorite places just to kill some time whenever I'm there. Well, there was things that I didn't even know people were doing, like the biohacking stuff, which is like mind blowing. Like what? It's like, yeah, really, really cool stuff. Luke, Skyler, you uh, encountered anything uh, surprising at DEF CON? I, I would say like for me, so I, I've only been once. I'll, I'll preface with that. So when I went, it was kind of like a, a refreshing like, oh, uh, I'm where I need to be moment because when I was in line for merch, they encourage you to kind of like weasel your way to the front if you can. Uh, at least that's that was the case during the time I was there. Uh, but the, the, the DEF CON helpers that are, you know, yelling at you while you're in line, uh, trying to be funny and keep everybody engaged, they, without so many words, said, if you see a gap, fill it. You don't have to ask permission. If you see a gap, fill it. And uh, we, we saw some people that were, the way that the line was organized, there was a door around one of the corners right next no. to <laughs> checkout. And there were, because people were waiting for so long, you're on your phone, you're talking to somebody, or you're just kind of zoning out because you've been waiting just so long. Uh, I watched people just kind of slip in. And uh, the people that were, that did catch that, they just kind of looked at each other and just get, get, it was like, all right, yeah, you got to respect the game because the organizers of DEF CON were even saying, fill the gaps. Uh, that was probably one of the more surprising things I've seen as far as uh, trainings go, I, I think getting to see some of the RFID flipper zero villages or the, like the flipper zero talk was probably one of the coolest things I saw just because they were able to recreate or they did recreate a version of the Bishop Fox long range RFID hacking tool. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen that before where mm -hmm. they get these big hid, hid readers. Like you'd see it like a parking garage that can go, you know, three to five feet. So uh, they just kind of recreated that in a more compact way. And we're, we're just showing you how you could just get indoors, how they were able to remotely communicate with uh, their, their RFID reader through their Flipper Zero in their car. So they literally sat at like a parking garage, had it outside of a, a business building's door, didn't tell anybody, there were no signs, it wasn't connected to the building, they just had a stand with this badge reader, and it just told people to scan their badge before they walk in. And they like, they collected... I don't, I don't know how many of dozens of uh, users' badge numbers, and they were able to clone them and get in the building. So that was that was pretty cool to watch. From the DEF CON side, um, I know one of the pieces of advice Jeff gave me was, you know, don't spend all day in talks. And I will say that when I heard that, I said, um, I'll probably go to a bunch of talks because that's what I do at the normal, the normal cons. <laughs> and I did that in Black Hat. But it really quickly in DEF CON, you realize there's a lot of interesting stuff going on and I don't want to spend all day in talks. So I had a couple planned. I had like maybe four planned out to and I went to two. So the whole rest of the time we spent in villages and, and other stuff like that. And um, the thing that was cool and I hark on what Aaron is saying, it's I think it's a place where you get to look at the things that you don't get to do maybe um, have hands on all the time. So we're very delved in the AppSec community. We do it professionally and some of us do it after hours um so we don't get to play with some of the other tools and toys and other stuff or interests um but like some of the interest for me is physical pen testing social engineering and stuff i enjoy hearing about those stories and war stories whatever so we got to go to the social engineering village and watch the people do the actual cold calls and prepared calls and stuff like that and that was a really neat experience to go in there and actually hear people get to talk of course there's a lot of dial hang up dial hang up because nobody's picking up 
but when one works, you get to kind of see these people just kick off and, and impersonate, you know, somebody to get information from these companies. The very first one, the lady was onto them right away. She was like, I don't think I should give you any of this information. And they just went rolled right onto the next uh, person and, and got a bunch of information with a, a little bit of time left. So um, that was neat to go to. And something, and maybe we'll touch on this later too, but I just in doing research and, and other stuff for the job and, and, and security in general, you, you get attached to certain personas, whether it be a Twitter persona or a YouTube persona. So they had John Hammond in there um, moderating the social engineering. And, and I've, I've watched John's videos for, you know, four or five years um, when I was first getting into security. So it was cool to see him in person as well. So you get to see some of the personalities you follow virtually and you get to see the social engineering um, live. So that was a really cool experience. You guys got to meet Kettle, I assume, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the the guys from Portswigger, me and Aaron talk about this all the time. We post stuff in chat all the time because they d directly deal with AppSec stuff. So obviously, if you followed Twitter at all, James Kettle had a kid and didn't get to go to any of the talks. So I was lucky enough to get to go to Black Hat and to DEF CON. So I got to see Gareth's talk and then I got to read the white papers for um, James Kettle afterwards. Yeah, those guys are super cool, but it, it, it's cool to go see uh, the guys that you follow virtually. You get to see them in person and, and listen to what they've been working on the last year. So that is a good point. If you are lucky enough to be able to go to DEF CON and Black Hat, some of the most interesting research is going to be dropped at Black Hat first, and then they'll give the very same talk again at DEF CON. So you get two cracks at it that way, and you can maybe go hear that talk you know, at Black Hat and then have the free time at DEF CON to wander around the villages. And... That's exactly what I did. I, there was a Gareth's talk I saw at Black Hat. He gave it again on Saturday, or I think he gave it Sunday, and I wasn't staying that late. So I wouldn't have even been able to see his talk at DEF CON if I didn't go to Black Hat. So. Well, tell me about the badges, guys. What'd they do this year? Well, I broke the tabs on mine. Uh, these super nice injection molded cases. Yeah. I kept People kept making comments like, oh, they're afraid to open it because they'll break the tabs. I'm like, that's not a problem. And as soon as I did it, yeah, so I broke both of them. So I might be able to. can't have here. nice things, Aaron. I know. But they are pretty cool. Um, I mean, the technical specs, I'm not really in the hardware space. I, but again, it's one of those things where you're like, I kind of am into it. Like, I'd like to know more about it, um, especially since I have a, a, my eight year old boy is, says he wants to be a robotics engineer. Uh, we'll see if that, you know, he sticks with it. But for the time being, it seems like these Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and things would be a great place for him to um, start playing with stuff. And so I'd like to learn a little bit more about it um, so that I can help him. But supposedly it's a touchscreen, although I don't think the... Well, let me just start from the beginning. So it starts with, like, there's a DEF CON game. It's a Game Boy uh, emulator. I think you can you can actually play Game Boy and Game Boy Color ROMs. Definitely looks like the unit cost on these badges may be a little higher than it has been in past years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think they're selling right now for 160 bucks. You can go buy a badge. I can't sell mine because I got broken tabs. <laughs> no, they seem really nice. Um, you know, an actual um, lithium ion battery in the back, uh, external storage, uh, D pad, AV, start select, touchscreen, IR sensor. It's got um, single uh, add on support, so you can have different cards that add to it. Well, the board on it too, they said, the, is the newest Raspberry Pi board. Like, I don't know if it's just now on market or not even on market yet, but we essentially got, everybody at DEF CON got prototype kind of the newest Raspberry Pi version. And I'm not into hardware hacking either, so I couldn't tell you what the newest specs on those are, but I know they said that they were either not out or coming out the week of DEF CON. So. so is it a top end Pi 5 then? No, I think I think the what was significant, and again, I'm not a hardware guy, so I, some of this some of the subtlety is probably lost upon me. But I think it's this particular chip, and it can like switch between ARM architecture and RISC five architecture. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't. I wish I knew more about it so I could explain it to you guys better. But um, it's like that particular chipset is what was released, and that's that's the big deal. It's, uh, what's what's your favorite feature of the badge? Well, hmm. I mean, the games, are, it's cool. Like, it's a full Game Boy emulator, uh, and you could if, you know, load legally obtained ROMs, I'm sure. Um, but you can also create your own. And what that process looks like, I'm not entirely sure. I've never done it. But it's, that's one of those things that we talked about that, like, actually, I'd like to figure this out. 
uh, especially with kids that are just getting old enough to play video games. Like, hey, let's do something. Because there's, yeah, they were advertising, I think, uh, on the GitHub page with the new firmware that I flashed. They were advertising, uh, you can, like a particular development kit that's like drag and drop in some, you know, what you see is what you get sort of like way, generate a little Game Boy game. That's pretty cool. Well, I haven't gone down that rabbit hole yet, but uh, it seems like that'd be a fun thing to do, with, particularly with the kids. Well, did any of you guys learn anything uh, on a technical level? I mean, not just got exposed to something, but actually, you know, saw something demonstrated, uh, heard about a new technique, got introduced to some research, something like that, that you were able to come home and use or expect to be able to. Yeah, so I'm a big uh, proponent of the port sugar labs and stuff like that so gareth came out with the uh, email splitting stuff and they port sugar guys they do research in a very interesting and maybe other people do this as well this is just the people that i follow um, but they go after the rfcs themselves and look at how they're wrote and and what they kind of have that might be odd or could be exploited it might be something that was wrote in um, way from the past whatever so gareth had found a type of uh, an encoded word formatting that's in these emails and was able to use it on GitHub to bypass a lot of um, restrictions around restricting certain GitHub repos from uh, email access. So say you only have a Microsoft account, you can only get to Microsoft um, repos if you have a Microsoft account. He's able to submit an email to them that looks like a Microsoft account, but actually goes to his own personal account just because of the way the email parsers work. And he had found those in a couple different libraries as well. And then they put up a lab on Portsrigger so that you could actually try it. But actually learning what the RFC is, how he looked into it, how he exploited it, the, his actual use case for it, what was he was able to bypass with it. In our day-to-day, -day, like what we do with web apps, how much are we going to see that? How much are we going to try that? Probably not that much, maybe like 10, 15% of the time. But it's an interesting thing to get you to think about things a little bit differently. How many times do you enter in an email to verify yourself? Can you change that so that you, you know, if you're restricted by domain, you can get access to something you're not supposed to? That was a very interesting talk for me. Yeah, not to copy Luke's homework, but that was, um, that was the one talk that I really wanted to go to because I thought it was going to be the most practical for what we do for a variety of reasons. Um, because I've been specifically asked by clients to try to bypass that type of um, security control before. Um, can, you know, is there any way to, to get by this? And I think this research would be useful in that situation. Um, yeah, my, my understanding is, at least I think the way Gareth explained it was, a lot of these application developers aren't writing their own validations for emails because it's complex. And so they outsource it to a library that conforms to the RFC. And those RFCs were written in 1982, and they accounted for all sorts of bizarre wacky things that just are no longer even remotely considered normal anymore and, and they've been forgotten bang but, paths <laughs> yeah i mean I, right he was picking on ruby jeff i thought you'd you'd really appreciate the talk oh i've read it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um and and i mean to be fair the the ruby mail library works right i mean it, it does what it's supposed to do which is exactly. the problem <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was actually reading some of the RFCs trying to understand like what his path looked like. And this is just so esoteric. You're like, the, who came up with this stuff? But you know, Gareth makes that very evident in his in his talk. Uh, yeah, and he's talking. and you say who came up with it. He someone asked that as one of the questions at the end. Why did they even put this stuff in here? And he thinks it's cross language stuff so that you can get characters that are um, you know, not in the English language. So make sure that you're supporting, you know, uh, an email that might have uh, Arabic characters in it or something like that. So they're, they're just trying to cover all their bases and then it never changed and then they never used it. And then Gareth finds it and bypasses a bunch of stuff in the future. I mean, so. early mail servers had to support weird things like 7-bit encoding and just, just nasty stuff. And I mean... By the time I was a mail admin, most of that stuff was gone, but occasionally you still ran into it. And so I actually read that research too and was like, man, this is interesting because these are all the things that I forgot about email over the last 20 years. And <laughs> it's really kind of fun to see that stuff come up again. And, and I will admit, you know, I don't think I've ever seen anybody put a comment to an email address, but you can. So there's, there's, there's fun games to play. and. I look forward to uh, throwing some of that stuff at some web apps too.
Yeah, and the way Gareth presents it is super accessible. Like it's easy to understand what he's saying. And then on top of that, he's he's very uh, clear in his, at least in the white paper, I reread through it. Um, really breaks it down in a way that you can understand. And then as Luke mentioned, there's labs. This is a great setup for um, really understanding the content. Yeah, and from maybe a not AppSec side, going to that social engineering village, it's one of those things that for legal reasons, they can't record those. So you can't go watch those on YouTube. You can watch people do cold calls if they did it on their own, but to actually watch the DEF CON social engineering village, you can only see it if you're in person. And so I was always curious on, you know, we got Microsoft employees to give us what version they're on and what antivirus they're using, whatever. And so how did they do that, right? And one of the techniques they were using is, is posing as auditors. Well, hey, we have a, we're the third party auditor coming to you and we need this information. We have a questionnaire of five questions. We understand you might be off today. We just need you to answer them real quick. It would help us out a lot. And that way we don't have to email you later. Thanks a lot. So learning some of those techniques was also interesting for me. Again, it's something you learn that maybe you wouldn't use in your normal work every day, but still something that's technical to learn that it could be useful later if you needed to do a social engineering thing or even the same thing applies to phishing emails right absolutely well Skylar, did you have anything you wanted to add i, I think we we heard quite a bit there i'll open it up one more time uh, do you guys have like what what's the best thing you came back from summer camp with i probably kind of touched on this already but i think the most valuable thing i came away with was a plan for next time and how to prepare better. Now that I understand the format of things, the layout of things, next time I go, I'll know exactly what I want to see and lay out time accordingly. Cause I didn't even try to do anything like CTFs, which I think would be a ton of fun, but maybe next time I'll, you know, allocate time, sign up. I'm sure you have to sign up ahead of time. That kind of, so the plan, having a plan ahead of time. And I don't think you could have made, like if you told me that six weeks ago, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been prepared still. Uh, but now having gone to see it, experienced it, Round two will be better. I feel a blog in your future, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, I'll consider it. How, how not to break the tabs in the back of your DEF CON badge? I got to ask one last question because I haven't been since. How cool is the sphere thing? Oh, yeah, that's a good question, Jeff, <laughs> because I think it touches on something else about Vegas because I've never been before. But like everything is just so I kept being struck by how massive everything was. I didn't mention this earlier when you asked about tours, but like Ben Mauck and um, Mike Spitzer knew all of the maze ways, like all the mazes through all of the casinos and things. And then, uh, as Luke mentioned, Dave Kennedy walked us around um, Caesars Forum. But I just kept being struck by how massive everything was. Like that sphere is just like, this is insane. You don't see this anywhere else. Vegas is just such a, a weird place full of gigantic, huge, megalithic things. So the thing about the sphere that I think is very interesting is that Vegas is the con consumer industry. Everything is an advertisement. They, everybody wants you to buy stuff. The sphere has emojis. They don't, they don't, they're not trying to sell you anything. They just, they literally spend all their GPU power and however much they spent to put up an emoji of it frowning because it's hot out. Like that's the type of people they are. So I've never been inside of it, but the outside of it is very cool. And it's a point you can see it from almost anywhere. You can see it from the conference center. Uh, the monorail actually takes you right past it. Um, I would like to go one day. That's something that um, the first time I went to Vegas, it wasn't a thing yet. Um, I've heard good things about it. So yeah, it's, it's cool. very cool. What's inside of it? Just the same kind of thing? It's, it's a venue. It's like a, a, a concert venue for the most part. Yeah, everything is extreme. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah, the way Dave told it to me is they have a couple of different shows in there. When we were there, one of the shows was kind of like the history of Earth. And so they have the big sphere and they show you inside. You sit in your seat and they have a, a huge screen that goes through the history of Earth. And, and you, goes, you fly down through a valley and across the volcano and all this stuff. Um, so it's just a, kind of an immersive, big experience, but on a, on a massive, massive 3D scale. Um, I shouldn't say 3D. They don't have glasses or anything that I know of. But it's, it's a, I can't remember what you call it. So like this whole inside of the dome is the screen or, you know, a large number of screens, but the sphere has completely maxed out. Like, like what Aaron was saying, like, it's just way over the top. <laughs> um, you know, if you YouTube some of the concert videos from there, like the U2 one was insane. I heard the fish concert was insane too. Uh, but yeah, you sit down and the entire building just like the outside is L lcd screens or led screens the inside is led screens um and so when you're inside aaron like you 
the screen goes like behind you. And so you're completely immersed in whatever environment they're putting you in. Hmm. Yeah. I'll have to go back, check it out. All right. Well, I guess that's my kind of final thought on the subject. I, I don't think if you're excited about InfoSec and you've never been to a con before, DEF CON or Black Hat is necessarily your best bet for a first experience. But certainly, if you've been in the industry for a while, you know, and you're looking to get a broader perspective, maybe get some ideas, maybe see some things that you didn't realize were, were under the InfoSec umbrella, I think it's absolutely a great place to go and, and probably the best place to go for that. And also, if you are in, you know, a niche situation where you really need that absolute cutting edge research, Black Hat is usually the place where that stuff drops first. So for another reason, you know, that is another reason to make that the place to be. But I want to thank everybody for being our guest today. And I want to thank you guys for watching and listening. Security Noise is a production of Trusted Tech LLC. If you or your organization has questions or needs information security, go to www.trustedsec.com. We'll see you next time.